Hello, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Analyze This, Mr. Bond, my channel where I talk about the adventures of James Bond 007 and dig for what lies beneath the surface. This is part two of our look at the films of Roger Moore, which means we are talking about The Man with the Golden Gun. The Man with the Golden Gun followed the very financially successful Live and Let Die, but was met with a mixed reception at the box office, and thus Golden Gun kind of uh, left the Bond series in an awkward place after its release. It's still something of an uh, odd man out when people talk about the Roger Moore era. Many of the other films have their ardent defenders, but Golden Gun tends to be seen as a, you know, a bit of a unloved child. However, it's a film that I find tremendously entertaining. In fact, I'll watch it more often than I will Live and Let Die in many cases, just because I appreciate, again, its uniqueness in the scheme of the Bond film franchise. There's a respect in which the three films of this period, the early 70s, Diamonds Are Forever, Live and Let Die, and The Man with the Golden Gun, all collaborations between director Guy Hamilton and writer Tom Mankiewicz, have this sort of seedy, unsavory quality that is unique in the overall feeling of the Bond film spectrum. And it gets to the sort of pulpiness of the Bond character. Uh, the Fleming novels were not high literature, they were pulp literature, and many of Fleming's virtues were the ability to lean into pulp tropes, and part of that is a element of strong dreamlike surrealism. This is underappreciated as an element of the Bond franchise, I think, um, but it, it's a pretty significant element of Bond's DNA that he inhabits a world that is very heightened and has sort of peculiar nightmarish figures in it. The good example would be, you know, Odd Job killing people with a steel brimmed bowler hat or jaws in his metal teeth. These sort of very peculiar, almost cartoonish elements, but rendered with a, a, a sort of panache. That, that is an element that really comes straight out of Fleming. In, in Fleming's novels, there are still elements that are so, you know, a little bit out there that still haven't been, uh, been adapted today, like the, uh, the Wild West town and train from his novel Diamonds Are Forever. We just finally got a version of The Garden of Death from You Only Live Twice and No Time to Die, but it was very toned down relative to what Fleming had put on the page. And... To an extent, what I see in these three movies, especially Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun, is that they lean into this sort of dreamy, surreal feeling with these sort of horror elements that often pop in and out of the Bond stories, and they kind of lean into it in a big way. You certainly get that here in The Man with the Golden Gun. Um, as much as the movie is is often a little goofy and silly, uh, the core concepts of it feel very in line with the character. The idea of uh, a villain having a sort of weird funhouse where he brings in essentially prey to have like a cat and mouse game with and lures them in just to kill them for sport. That feels to me like a quintessentially Fleming idea. And the strangeness of it being built around, you know, hokey old haunted house tropes is even more interesting. Um, and that's essentially how this movie opens. This movie opens like Live and Let Die did with this big period of where is Bond? It It's kind of doing... The Man with the Golden Gun follows what you might call like the second film excess syndrome. Um, we see it here with The Man with the Golden Gun. We see it a little bit, you could argue, with License to Kill. You could see argue that it happens with Tomorrow Never Dies. You could argue that it happens with Quantum of Solace. That each of these movies, after a fairly well-regarded debut, lean into one element or another in a way that is a little bit more extreme and unbalanced and kind of uh, 
recapitulate some of the stuff that came in the prior movie without as much grace. Um, and certainly you see that in in Golden Gun, picking up threads like the return of J.W. Pepper, which is just horribly ill-advised. Nobody needed to see the jokey racist sheriff from Live and Let Die somehow in, you know, in Asia while Bond's on a mission. But they kind of like pull that over. The comedy is a little bit accentuated. But you also have this sort of dreamlike peculiarity about it that Live and Let Die leaned into in a big way. Things like the uh, the funeral assassination on the street in New Orleans in Live and Let Die, that's sort of very peculiar surrealism of the pivot from like the murder to the celebration moments and all that kind of incorporated it's 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 so strange and i feel like the fun house opening for the man with the golden gun carries a lot of that dna and another one of the tropes that this movie is repeating from live and let die is this pre-title sequence where where bond is absent but it fills the void differently than live and let die it is, again, like Live and Let Die, using the pre-title sequence to set up the villain. But here, that makes a lot more sense because Scaramanga is the first Bond villain to really be established as the anti-Bond. You could argue that Red Grant was really the first time we had the true anti-Bond archetype appear in the series, but this is the first film to be consciously aware of it. Scaramanga is the man who was introduced relaxing on a glamorous beach with a beautiful woman, drinking champagne. He dresses very nicely in suits. He enjoys the finer things in life, just like James Bond. And he has one of the greatest gadgets in the entire series at his disposal, the Golden Gun. Um, in fact, you know, it's a greater gadget than Bond has in this movie. And indeed, Scaramanga has the like the giant car gadget of the movie too he has a flying car he's got a golden gun the movie is signaling in all sorts of ways that he is this mirror image of bond and so when the pre-title sequence focuses on this character to establish him there's a certain level of sense it, um good sense that that makes narratively speaking and The Man with the Golden Gun tries a structural gambit here that the series never really does again, but I, I quite like it that it, it lays out a pattern of events with this man coming to Scaramanga's island, making a sort of loose deal with Knickknack, and then becoming Scaramanga's prey in his funhouse that is repeated almost beat for beat as the climax of the movie, but with a reversal right down to the final moment where in the pre-title sequence, and this doesn't make a ton of narrative sense, Scaramanga shoots a dummy that he has of James Bond 007, implying that he's, you know, idolized Bond as a target for a long time. In the final version of the scene, Bond actually takes the, replace, replaces the, the dummy and kills Scaramanga. It's this sort of reprisal with variation that is an interesting structure, and it would be great to see a Bond film try to do that sort of thing again, to sort of establish a framework at the beginning and then use that same framework as your climax, but, you know, break it apart. I think that has a nice effect to it. I think where, where Scaramanga's story falls apart a little bit is generally in the middle of this story. There's, there are two stories going on in this movie, one is about Bond thinking Scaramanga is out to kill him and asking why, and that inevitable conflict between those two men coming together. And then this subplot, which is significantly less developed, about the Solex agitator and the so the energy crisis. And you can kind of feel how half-hearted the movie is about it to the point where, you know, Scaramanga, even as he's showing Bond off his lair that he's built around this, you know energy uh transformation with solar technology and all this stuff he doesn't really understand how it works he's just been kind of along for the ride it doesn't really impact the climax at all and in fact the film waits till the very end of the movie to show us why the solex solex agitator and solar power is dangerous 
Um, it finally reveals that it has like a super weapon applicability, but that's something that's not established very early on in a way that would give it any of it some some real stakes. So, you know that that whole stuff never really quite comes together with what we know of Scaramanga and this this sort of conflict that is inevitable from the start that he will face off against James Bond. And that's one of the narrative weaknesses of this movie. But at the same time, this movie, like Live and Let Die, has a very relaxed sort of flow that I enjoy, especially since The Man with the Golden Gun is the last movie in the series to truly qualify as a a travelogue experience. It is so embedded in its locations that it really feels like you're getting a feeling for what Asia was at this time. Um, and, and I appreciate the level of detail and emphasis it is on setting scene after scene after scene in places with a real genuine character, right down to putting uh, the MI6 office in the field on the, on the, you know, sunk, uh, Queen Elizabeth in the harbor with, like, all the sets at a slant. It's just, it's, it's just so invested in its setting in a way that Bond movies will never really be again. You'll get plenty of great location moments in subsequent Bond movies, lots of great establishing shots, but never this feeling of just, like, being in a place at a point in time. And uh, I, th I think there's something really magical about that. Now, after Bond's uh, mannequin is, is, kind of, uh, is kind of defaced by Scaramanga at the end of the pre-title sequence, we get the title sequence, and uh, much like the movie, the song has a sort of, um, I don't know, I don't know how to, how to describe it, sort of, sort of a sleazy characteristic to it. Um, it's a very unusual Bond song, uh, very campy for the period at the time, but it's like, there's a sort of sleazy element to this movie that even John Barry's score is picking up on a little bit. Um, and again, that talks about this sort of, it fits in with the Mankiewicz-Hamilton trilogy of sorts, but it, it has this sort of... Um, characteristic of Bond really navigating the underworld and the seedy quarters of it that is also fairly unique to The Man with the Golden Gun, and I appreciate that it's spending a lot of time in sort of, like, dark back alleyways, like Bond confronting Lazar. Lazar is not some glamorous individual. He's just, like, a little guy with his own little, like, shop where he's producing assassin weapons, and it's, like, kind of back hidden away... This sort of idea that Bond is sort of navigating in his pursuit for Scaramanga, the the underbelly of the world, is kind of is kind of magnified in this movie with its overall sleazy exploitation film texture, um, and that that shows up in other ways too. But uh, once he's finally introduced after the title song wraps, we're seeing Roger Moore once again, as he was presented in Live and Let Die, as this more um, gentlemanly sort of Bond. Now, he's not very gentlemanly in behavior in these first two movies. My my core theory here is really that Roger Moore is a Bond of two Bonds. You have his version of Bond for Live and Let Die and the man with, golden, with the golden gun, the sort of Mankiewicz-Hamilton version of the Roger Moore Bond, and then you have the Roger Moore Bond that is established with the spy who loved me, who is functionally a, a slightly different character with a different dynamic. But Roger Moore enters the movie in this wonderful double-breasted suit, which kind of establishes the fashion template for what I start to think of as Roger Moore Bond, this sort of very... I don't know, the way he dresses in London, it just always seems so quintessentially British with a little bit of playboy flair. Um, and indeed, The Man with the Golden Gun also goes on to establish one of the most iconic bits of Roger Moore Bond attire, the safari suit. Uh, the safari jacket makes not one, but two appearances in this movie. And uh, 
it is just such a quintessential part of the Roger Moore Bond image, and it it's established right here. There's a sense in which Roger Moore's Bond style really comes into its own here, more so than it did in Live and Let Die, um, where, I don't know, his style is a little bit more... I don't know... It's it's similar, but it doesn't feel as as have it doesn't have as much swagger as you might say he does in this movie. He has a lot of swagger in this movie. Um, he is he is very arrogant in this movie. In in many ways, Bond is just a a total colossal jerk in this movie. Much like he was in Live and Let Die, but in this movie even more so. He's just smug, arrogant, condescending. He, uh, and it's very satisfying to see Bond just be so unapologetically mean-spirited a lot of the time, I, especially when he's dealing with villains. Um, it's, this is a, this sort of condescending aspect of Roger Moore's Bond in this movie is very off-putting when he's dealing with women, and we'll talk about his relationship with the women in this movie. Uh, I mean, this is, this, in the history of the series, this might have the, um, the worst treatment of the Bond girls in the entire canon, which is saying, which is saying something. Um, but in terms of his engagement with the villains, it's just so satisfying to see Roger Moore's Bond be so relentlessly smug and condescending. I love the scene where Bond confronts Lazar and just has him at gunpoint in his own, in his own uh, workshop. Uh, Speak now or forever hold your peace. That sort of, that sort of uh, cat playing with his prey sort of feeling is wonderful with Roger Moore's Bond. And it carries over in subsequent movies, too. It's one reason that Roger Moore's Bond is the most satisfying Bond to see have dinner scenes with villains or extended conversations with them. Because there's this sense that Moore is always playing with his opponent. And he's always feeling like he's really got the edge um, we'll see it show up in one of my favorite moments in Moonraker, where um, Bond is sporting with Drax and shoots the assassin out of the tree, and just that sort of like raised eyebrow quip back to Drax, showing that he didn't miss a beat. It's like that sort of layer of dripping condescension is very satisfying when Bond is confronting a villain. It's less appealing here in his engagement with women. Um, in the sense that he is fairly ruthlessly harsh with uh, Andrea Anders, and she's, uh, you know, she is a fairly tragic character, um, and Moore's Bond feels like he gets pretty mean with her unnecessarily and gratuitously. Um, and then there's his treatment of Mary Goodnight, who, Mary Goodnight is an interesting character in the sense that she becomes kind of there's a stereotype about the Bond franchise that the Bond women are always, like, ditzy bimbos, and that's kind of like the stereotypical parody version of a Bond film. And it's actually not that common a trope in the Bond movies, uh, certainly not in the way that it gets leaned into here in this movie, where Mary Goodnight is, is a character who... Uh, who Bond clearly treats with a little bit of disdain, like when M is talking to Bond and tells him that Mary Goodnight has been assigned to him. You can just tell Bond has a very low opinion of her throughout this whole movie, but because he's just such a such a playboy, he's he's still down to uh, to make the most of the opportunity of being with a beautiful woman. But you can just tell, like he just has no time for her at all like the level of impatience he has with her during her like inept bumbling during the the climax what climax when they're trying to get the solex agitator out before scaramanga's base explodes it's just i don't know it's it's an interesting angle to potentially pair bond up with somebody that is just totally inept and there's potentially an interesting dynamic there but the way it's kind of like just layered into a movie that has such a, a gen bond just generally treating all the women in the movie with such a level of disdain. It, it just doesn't read as well. Um, and I think in general, the subsequent movies do a much better job of giving uh, more 
very interesting characters to bounce off with. I'm thinking of like Melina Havlock and Free Your Eyes Only or, you know, Octopussy herself in the film of the same name. Where Maude Adams reappears, it's it's nice that she actually gets to come back and play a character with a little bit more heft in Octopussy. Roger Moore seems to do a little bit better with with characters that have a little bit more meat on the bone. But in general, I do like my Bonds to be a little bit more uh, ruthless and less likable. And this is definitely Roger Moore's least likable performance. It really feels like he's just kind of going in, being, uh, being a jerk to everybody in this movie, including M and the MI6 crew. One thing I really like in this movie is just like how much MI6 has like stressed out worker vibes. Everybody is just kind of snapping at one another. Nobody really seems to be getting along with each other. There's, it just feels like a hostile work environment. And M and Bond seem a little antagonistic. Bond and Q seem a little antagonistic. It's a very refreshing dynamic, um, especially in light of how many of the recent Bond movies have kind of made MI6 feel like a family and everybody gets along and everybody's buddy buddy. It's 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 fun to see a version of MI6 where they're just really co-workers and you get the sense that they just couldn't can't wait to be just like apart after the work days through. It would be something I'd love to see the movies actually return to because I think there's a lot of opportunity for for good humor there if there's a little bit more like latent hostility between the MI6 crew. Um, and again, it plays very well when, when Bond is dealing with Scaramanga. Their, 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 their confrontation at the climax of the movie is great. Not just in, in part because, you know, Roger Moore's Bond gets a little bit self-righteous at that moment. And I, 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 I think it just, I think it, it's, it feels Obviously, Scaramanga is is a monster compared to, to to Roger Moore's Bond in the sense that he's just kind of willing to kill anybody. So it's not like that Bond doesn't have some level of uh, high ground, but it's just very clear too that when Scaramanga starts to compare the two of them, there's a little bit more bite to it because this Bond really is a gray area character. This Roger Moore's Bond, especially in these first two movies, is is very much an anti-hero before he becomes more like the heroic. British icon in The Spy Who Loved Me, there's this sense that he's really kind of like a disreputable sort of rakish character in these two movies. And it doesn't always play out in the most savory of ways in these movies, um, certainly of its time in its sort of like ruthless handling of women and in... Uh, some of the cultural condensa condescension that comes through at different points. Um, I think that's that's one thing that's generally true of Roger Moore's Bond is that when Roger Moore's Bond visits uh, foreign countries, he, he doesn't tend to be as generously spirited as some of the other Bonds. Um, Fleming's Bond, you know, for all of his sometimes lamentable attitudes about other cultures was also very like genuinely curious and interested in them and Roger Moore's Bond doesn't get um doesn't really get as much of that as Fleming's Bond did um Conroy's Bond certainly gets a little bit more of that like uh learning from another culture aspect here and there throughout his his tenure Roger Moore's Bond tends to be a little bit more like smugly assured in his British identity so he tends to there's a level of of condescension for other cultures, which I think um, is is sometimes you know less than optimal, uh, and that and that carries through even in in subsequent movies. Um, but let's talk through uh, some of the other aspects of this movie that are really really uh, you know really unusual about this movie is is one is uh it's very unusual to see bond be made the uh the kind of butt of a joke the way he is when he's he's with saida and is is forced to swallow the the golden bullet and that feels um that feels like something that is like very unique to uh moore's bond like no other bond would attempt a moment like that where bond is so uh so openly humiliated 
on screen, but Roger Moore plays that very well. I mean, Roger Moore's Bond is very great at being sort of like flustered and indignant about something and then just kind of like keeping a stiff upper lip through it. Uh, and and that, that moment I, I kind of appreciate. I'm less forgiving of some of the other excesses in this movie, like the, uh, the slide whistle when he does his evil can evil jump. Um, wonderful stunt, uh, but less less uh, less thrilling than you would want it to be because of that. Um, I really, but but I'm I really appreciate the uh, introduction of the martial arts element into Bond. So there's a sense in which, and it, it's not to the same extent that Live and Let Die did this. Live and Let Die was pulling Bond into like the black exploitation genre a little bit. And the man with the golden gun is toying with this idea of Bond flirting with like the, the sort of kung fu martial arts film genre of the time. And the movie doesn't spend a lot of time with it, um, but there's there's some fun to be had there. And I actually think it's it should be said that, that Roger Moore's Bond physically acquits himself relatively well in these first two movies. Bond, uh, Roger Moore's Bond has a reputation for not being the strongest fighter of the bunch, and I, I think that's fair, but it, you know, he's generally asked to do fairly standard fisticuffs in these first two movies, and he does pretty well. Like, I, I he's doing a lot, he's throwing a lot of the punches himself in the, the fight in Saida's dressing room in Beirut in this movie, and I think he does credibly well. There is a sense in which Roger Moore's Bond has a slightly harder edge in these first two movies that he he loses in it, that loses in subsequent adventures, and and you know, for for better or worse, that's that's kind of the trajectory his Bond takes, but he loses the edge of being feeling like a real assassin, which he still does in these first two movies. He really does feel a bit like a, an arrogant killer. Um, which makes him an interesting foil to Scaramanga in this movie, as I've noted before. So, like, it's that kind of dynamic that's really, that's really satisfying to me. And then, so in the, to get back to the martial arts fight, he present, he handles himself relatively well. Now, that fight is essentially just setting up this big gag and a and a boat chase that is significantly less interesting than the boat chase we saw in Live and Let Die. There's a sense in which this movie is just like. Live and Let Die Part 2, the reheated Leftovers edition, but, you know, again, what keeps me going in this movie is the level of, like, cultural texture we get, like, the, just the feeling of the street outside the Bottoms Up Club, Bottoms Out, uh, Bottoms Up Club, um, the, the wonderful feeling of, um, of, Bond and Scaramanga's first confrontation in the movie happening at the, you know, at the match, the sporting match uh, amongst the crowd. And actually, I want to commend this movie when I talk about this sort of like nightmarish surrealism. Um, Maud Adams being dead besides Bond with that like discreet bullet hole in her chest and Bond not immediately noticing, it has this sort of horror movie vibe almost to it. Like it could have come out of like an Italian horror movie of the period if you've seen anything by Dario Argento or Mario Bava. That the sort of strangeness to it just feels so quintessentially pulp and quintessentially Bond to me. And, and the Bond movies have have kind of lost some of that strangeness over time um and and finally i think the movie really puts its foot forward once bond and scaramanga are are really kind of like put in a in a conversation together because christopher lee is just so magnificently sinister in these movies there's probably an alternate universe out there somewhere where christopher lee actually was cast as james bond in the 1960s and you had a version of the series where he played james bond i mean that's certainly plausible if you go back and see some of his earliest works in like the hammer film canon like hound of the baskervilles where he plays a uh sort of playboyish uh noble in Hound of the Baskervilles, that sort of feeling would have translated 
just perfectly to him playing Bond. So it's interesting to see him against Roger Moore because there is a feeling in which he really has the the weight of that sort of character about him. And he's such a pleasure to watch. He's so even in films where he's scenes where he's given like practically little to do or say, he's just such a, an arresting screen presence. Um I love the very discreet way. He doesn't get to do this much in the film. You would feel like it's a it would become a bigger thing because the golden gun gadget is so magnificent. But when he's like assembling and disassembling the gun to assassinate High Fat, uh, it's just he does such a great little job of like incorporating that into his conversation. And um, I don't know. I don't know. I could watch Christopher Lee read the phone book, to be honest with you. He's just one of those actors, much like Roger Moore himself. Roger Moore's talent for dialogue is is second to none. And and Bond's one-liners in this movie are are sometimes atrociously corny, but Roger Moore still makes them sing like their, their music. Um, the final confrontation between the two of them has a nice little bit of tension in part because we've already seen it play out before that sort of recursive structure it really it really works in the climax's favor in the sense that you feel like bond is especially against the odds cuz we know it's coming before bond does and i i think that's the real advantage to this movie's narrative structure that way is that you know uh having seen it all play out before and establishing your villain with this sort of cat and mouse game and then making bond the mouse it adds a layer of tension even as silly as that whole set piece is with you know al capone and all that stuff it it just kind of adds a level of tense dread especially with um knickknack's voice just kind of like occasionally coming on the loud speaker uh knickknack is such a wonderful henchman by the way i mean he's instantly memorable kind of weirdly lovable as much as he's creepy he's kind of like a a bit of a lovable scamp as far as as henchmen go um and certainly the climax even treats him that i mean the the final scenes even treat him that way with bond uh bond stringing him up on scaramanga's boat as he sails off you know i i don't know it's easy to see why golden gun is sort of like kind of stranded out there as a as a somewhat unloved movie and as much as i've talked about it i probably have highlighted things that just aren't quite that great about it but i just enjoy enjoy so much of the feeling and texture of this movie the clothing of this movie the locations in this movie and and generally roger moore's sort of unabashedly arrogant swagger in this movie in the first movie he just there's a there's a level of stiffness that goes away in this movie he's just kind of like a, a an interesting rascal to watch you know all ruthless somewhat just tremendously unlikable honestly but like in a way that is is just very arresting to watch because he's he's almost kind of like a bad guy who's been set out against other bad guys and i think that's how i often that's often how i think about connery's bond too to a different extent connery's bond is just like kind of a bad guy but he's been set out to take down other bad guys and i i think that in many ways is a model of bond that starts to to go away after the man with the golden gun um and we're going to see a big pivot towards a more heroic celebration of bond as sort of like a metaphorical icon for britain once the spy who loved me comes around and we'll be talking about that in the next entry in this series so let me know what you think about the man with the golden gun let me know how you feel about this movie um it's certainly it's certainly a movie that i i understand why people go either way on it and I will catch you in the next one.